Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Away from its land. 
Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. We will say the appointed psalm responsibly by full verse, and with the congregation saying the verses printed in bold. God takes a stand in the council of heaven and gives judgment in the midst of the gods. And all will judge unjustly and show favor to the wicked. Save the weak and the orphan. Defend the humble and needy. Rescue the weak and the poor. Deliver them from the power of the wicked. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Now I say to you, you are authorized, and all of your children of the whole side. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals, and fall like any ruler. Arise, O God, and rule the earth, for you shall take all nations for your own. second reading is from a letter to the Colossians. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, <clears throat> by the will of God, and Timothy, our brethren, and to the saints and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ in the Colossians. <clears throat> Grace to you and peace from God our Father. In our prayers for you, we have always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Jesus Christ and of the love that you have all for the saints because of the hope laid upon, laid up on from heaven. You have heard of this hope before in the word of the truth, the, the gospel that has come to you, just as it is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world. So it has been bearing fruit among our, yourselves from the day you have heard it and truly comprehend the grace of God. This you learn from effortless, our beloved fellow servant. He is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, and he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we have heard it, we have not ceased praying for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all the spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may lead lives worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, as you bear fruit in every good work and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from His glorious power, and may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints and in the light. He has rescued us from the power of the darkness and transferred us, in, transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. And thanks be to God.
Just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this, and you will live. But one of you justified himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan while traveling came near to him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him, put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. When I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three, do you think, was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer replied, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. That, that, that didn't really happen. Jesus just made that up as a story. 
quick thinking tour guide said, ah yes, but that is the inn he was thinking of. <laughs> well, I don't think I will come up with any new insights quite like that today. But nonetheless, there are things that we can plumb out of this oh so familiar and beloved story. First of all, we may think of it primarily as a sort of morality tale. What we should do to be nice to others, to be good to others, to show mercy to others. That's, this is what we ought to do. And yes, of course, we lay on that, that layer of the Samaritan and, and the Samaritans being, you know, mortal enemies of, of the Jews and, and, you know, and how odd it is that two Jews pass by the, the man who is half dead and it was the Samaritan who came along and took care of him. Yeah, we got that. But what we forget is that this parable doesn't stand on its own. This parable is wrapped around a sort of back and forth test between this lawyer and Jesus. Now we need to understand this was not a secular lawyer. He didn't do personal injury cases or bankruptcies or anything like that. He, he was a religious lawyer. He was supposed to know the law of Moses. And Luke makes it very clear that, that when this guy stands up to question Jesus, he is not asking an honest, open question. He's not trying to find out some burning question in his mind about the meaning of life or what God wants him to do. He stands up to test Jesus. And so he says, teacher, what do I got to do to inherit a kind of life? And Jesus replies, well, what is written in the law? What do you read there? Now this is, this is something that I overlooked in for possibly the first 50 years of my life. What is written in the law? What do you read there? Jesus is telling us in those two questions that neither those who say that the Bible has to be taken absolutely literally as it is written, nor those who say, well, we can, we can find our own meanings, we can read out of this or read into this anything we want. Neither of those positions is correct. What is written in the law? There are words that stand with meaning that are written in the law. But Jesus then follows that with, what do you read there? How do you interpret that? Because Jesus knows that even to take a passage of scripture and say it applies to a certain situation, like what must I do to inherit eternal life, you are already interpreting what is there. So we learn from Jesus that the words of the Bible are not, they, they, they don't have an unchanging literal meaning, but then neither can we pour onto an empty page whatever we want to see there. We must take scripture as it is, but then we must evaluate it for ourselves. We must interpret it in the light of our own experience, in the light of our community, our culture, our times, and every generation since the author of this gospel wrote down those words has had to do that. My seminary New Testament professor, uh, the Reverend Barbara Hall, peace be upon her, used to say, it's like entering a conversation. Not just a conversation with the author of Luke, and not just a conversation with what Jesus is saying, and not just a conversation with Luke's community. Because in many places, we find that the writer of the gospel is both addressing his own community as well as telling the story of Jesus. But even more than that, we are engaged in a conversation with every community, every generation for the last two millennia that have looked at these words and interpreted them for themselves. We must pay attention to all those voices and add our own voices to that ongoing, unending 
conversation. So, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And of course, the lawyer gives the right answer. I'd be surprised if he hadn't. <laughs> Love the Lord your God with everything you have and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus sort of looks at him and says, yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, you got it. You know, that's the law. Just go do the law and you will have eternal life. Which I imagine left the lawyer feeling a little bit sheepish or a little bit, oh, like he'd been served. And, uh, and he's probably not feeling very comfortable with himself. So he seeks to justify himself. When we all make a social faux pas in public and you know, we're feeling a little uncomfortable about it, we try, to, we try to, to get ourselves out of it by justifying what we've done. And so that's exactly what this religious lawyer does. He says, well then who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And Jesus doesn't give any of the answers that we might expect him to, that we might give. Your neighbor is the person who lives next door to you. The neighbor is the person who lives near to you. The neighbor is the person who's part of your family, part of your community, who looks like you, who thinks like you, who does things like you do. Sure, that's, that's our neighbor. And boy, does Jesus take us in another direction. We have the story of this, this man who is, has the misfortune of walking down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho to be ambushed by bandits. And they beat him up terribly. They strip him of all his clothing. This is, this is probably literally what Jesus meant. They stripped him of his clothing because clothing was a valuable resource back then. Think of it, every piece of clothing had to be made by hand from start to finish. That's why the guards at Jesus' crucifixion cast lots for his clothing. It was valuable. So not only is this poor guy lying there bleeding and probably unconscious or just going in and out, but he's also been left stripped naked. And that is an abomination. But what can he do? He's just like lying in a roadside ditch. He is half dead. Help arise, doesn't it? A certain priest of, of the temple was, was walking, happened to be walking that way. That Jericho, of course, was a, a suburb of Jerusalem, if you will, kind of a bedroom community, so there would be a lot of priests going back and forth on that road. This one just happened to come along. And he, he glances over, he sees this bloody, lifeless appearing figure over there and of course you can't touch blood you can't touch someone who has blood because you would ritually defile yourself he could not then perform his duties at the temple he kind of looks and then he kind of doesn't see kind of, you, you know how we are like like when we're going into the subway and there's the guy who's you know panhandling for change we see them and we don't see them that's what the priest did. Passed by on the other side of the road. It's funny because in, in the Greek, uh, it's almost as if Luke has made up a word of saying, you know, walking opposite around. <laughs> to make the point that he just went all the way around. Didn't want to go near it. He's probably dead. He's bleeding. Both of those are, those are taboo can't go near it. All right. Well, somebody else comes down the road. A Levite. Now, in case you've ever wondered what the difference is between a priest and a Levite, the priests of the temple came from the tribe of Levi. And uh, it's sort of, all priests were Levites, but not all Levites were priests. So, if that, if that clears that up for you. So, this Levite is coming down the road, and again, he sees it, and then doesn't see it. Does the same thing, he passes by on the other side, doesn't even go near him. 
So this this poor guy in the ditch is probably thinking his days are over. He's he's probably in a fog, maybe going in and out of consciousness. He's obviously in pain and and naked to boot. He would probably be humiliated. And then somebody else comes. Somebody else comes, actually sees him, and he continues to see him. And then he does something else. He goes over to him. And when he goes over him, over to him, he is moved with pity. And then he does the third important thing about this. He sees him, he goes to him, and then he acts. He takes care of him. He doesn't say, oh, I can't touch blood, I'll defile myself, because he's, he's not going to the temple. But he takes care of him. When it says he binds up his wounds, having covered them with oil and wine, which was a, a way of antiseptic, you know, an, an antiseptic for, uh, for wounds in that day, when he bound them up, what do you think he used for the binding? He probably had to ruin his own expensive clothes, his own valuable clothes, to bind up the wounds of someone with whom his people had, oh, it, was, it was just a horrible, generations-long blood feud almost. Called each other dogs. They just, they, they, they would not, could not see each other as human beings. But here, the Samaritan not only takes care of him, he goes out of his way, puts him on his own animal, which probably means he was riding the animal and now he's walking, leading the animal on, on his foot to that inn that Jesus was thinking of. And he takes care of him. And when he has to leave the next morning, he even pays the innkeeper money out of his own pocket for somebody who would call him a vile dog any other day. He does all this because he was moved with pity. And so, I just want to stop for a minute and, and emphasize how truly unusual it was that Jesus picked a Samaritan to be the, the hero of the story, and not just because of the feud between Samaritans and Jews. Remember the context of this event. Jesus, in the last chapter, Luke in the ninth chapter, has set his face toward Jerusalem. And he goes through many towns on his way there. And some welcomed him. And there was that one town of Samaritans that would not even give him an entrance. They would not even let him come through the city gates. Because his face was set toward Jerusalem. And remember, uh, James and John, they wanted to call down a you know, fire of hail and, and destroy them like Sodom and Gomorrah. Even Jesus, uh, just a little bit before this passage, he's, he's lamenting and, and decrying the, those cities that will not welcome those who bring news that the kingdom of God has come near. He says, it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on that day than for you. So, Jesus has every reason to be ticked off at Samaritans. They have refused him hospitality, which is one of the largest taboos in the Middle, in Middle Eastern culture. And Jesus has every reason to, to just hate Samaritans. And yet, when this religious lawyer asks him, who, well, who is my neighbor? Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero of the story. And when Jesus asks him, so which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell in with the hands of robbers? And notice the lawyer cannot even bring himself to name him. He says, the one who showed him mercy. He can't say it was the Samaritan. He just, he just can't go there. 
It's like his mind can't conceive of it, and yet he has to admit that is the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. I don't, I don't know whether this religious lawyer, when he first stands up to test Jesus, whether he's, whether he's trying to validate, you know, what do I got to do? to get into heaven. What do I got to do to have eternal life? It's like, what, what stops do I have to have my ticket punched at before I can get into heaven? And through this story, Jesus takes him 180 degrees, changes the nature of the question itself. It's not, who is my neighbor? Who do I have to be nice to? Who do I have to... Yeah, we don't have to smile at and, you know, do good things, do nice things for, you know, so that God will let me into heaven. No. Jesus is saying, who became a neighbor to the man who fell in with robbers? And it was the one who showed him mercy. Think of the enormity of this. Jesus deliberately chooses an outcast. An outcast from a people against whom he has legitimate complaints, legitimate current event complaints, and yet he overlooks all that and makes the Samaritan the one who shows mercy, who does those three things that are essential if we are indeed to love our neighbors as ourselves. He sees, he goes, and he does. He sees, he goes, and he does. The priest and the Levite did none of those. Well, they saw, right? They kind of, kind of ignored that they saw. And I only, I, 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 I wish I knew what went through that religious lawyer's head when he said, the one who showed him mercy, and Jesus told him to go and do likewise. Because Jesus, of course, is not just telling that lawyer to go and do likewise. Jesus is telling and showing us so that when we think, who is our neighbor? Who do we got to be nice to to get into heaven? Jesus is saying that is entirely the wrong question. Who becomes a neighbor to you by overcoming their cultural differences and, and, and looking past all the, 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 the grievances and grudges that we have against one another and goes and acts out of mercy because there is need? And how do we become a neighbor to those who are in need? We go and do likewise. Which requires that we see the need, that we're willing to respond to the need. And we do take action in response to the need. It's funny that Luke uses an odd word in Greek when the lawyer asked the original question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That word that is translated here as do could also mean acquire or, um, or earn. So it's, it's not just what must I do, but what, what must I acquire that will enable my heart to see do I, what walls inside me do I need to knock down? What dark corners do I need to shine light upon in case my neighbor is there? How do I not only see the need that is right in front of me, but actually go and look for it? Because just a matter of getting your ticket punched in the right station so that they'll let you into the final 
final uh, terminus in heaven. It's not that at all. It's being aware, being willing to see, being willing to be moved to go, and being willing to do. That's what the disciples, the 70 that Jesus sent out, that's what they did two by two in every town they went to. And what did they proclaim? The reign of God has come near to you. Because they did those things. The reign of God came near to that Samaritan and that poor beat up Jew because the Samaritan overcame all to show mercy. Who is our neighbor? Who do we want to overlook? Who do we like to avoid? Because we cannot avoid what Jesus is telling us. Because with his own life, he later becomes the outcast. He becomes the one that fell into the hands of robbers and, and thieves and murderers. He is left essentially by the side of the road, bleeding and half dead. They hang him on a cross. He becomes the beat of Jew. And yet, he overlooks all of that and does not repay kind with kind, but forgives and loves them anyway. Which of these three do you think was the neighbor to the man who fell into need? The one who shows him mercy. Let us go and do likewise. Amen. 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 Now in the assurance of eternal life given at baptism, let us stand as we are able to proclaim our faith and say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father of the Lord, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered and died. Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the creation and all in need. Good and gracious God, you have placed your word of love in the heart of your church. Fill your church with compassion, 
that you may bear the fruit of your healing mercy, a broken world, God of grace. You created the earth and seeds sprouting up to new life. We pray for the flourishing of fruit trees and orchards, vines and bushes. Prosper the work of those who plant, tend, harvest, and gather. God of grace, hear our prayer. Show us your ways and teach us your paths of justice and love. Raise up communities and national leaders to challenge and dismantle societal structures that perpetuate ethnic, racial, and religious profiling and discrimination. We now pray for our communities of Bloomfield and Glenridge. God of mercy, grace, hear our prayer. Come near to all in need. Orchestrate kindness in the face of cruelty. Hope where there is despair. Love in the face of neglect. Hurt where there is death. And healing in illness. We pray now for those on parish prayer list. God of grace, hear our prayer. Turn this community toward neighbors in need. Bring aid and support to those who are poor, beaten down, abused, forgotten, silenced, or avoided. God of grace, hear our prayer. We give thanks for the saints who revealed your love and mercy in this life. Inspired by their witness, strengthen us to live in hope. God of grace, hear our prayer. I invite you now to offer your own intercession and thanksgivings, either silently or aloud. For everyone who are on summer vacation or on summer adventures this weekend, please be with them, let them be safe, enjoy the beauty of your world. And may one day there'll be an end to gun violence and, and needless killing. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'd like to pray for the students, the guitar students, my wife, and so on. And we have got the word of the blessing yesterday that she has run the room. And she was going to Texas to boot camp. She's going into uh, kind of a kind of hospital park. And so it's very confusing for her. Uh, she's been convicted by that contract for five and a half years. Daughter of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these open prayers and those in our hearts into your holy name. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our people. Most merciful God, we confess our sins against you, O God, word and deed. My God, we Sisters and brothers in God, may the peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you.
Please be seated. Uh, those of you who were here a few weeks ago when I first visited here to, uh, to do some live work will remember me. I'm Father Barry Cimarelli. Again, I'm delighted to be with you. Um, I, I will um, turn over to anyone who has announcements that should be uh, made or Thank you, Francis Good morning, Christchurch family and friends who are worshiping with us here in person and those who are worshiping virtually. We are once again happy to welcome Father Signorelli and thank him for leading us in worship and bringing us today's message. As you are aware, Mother Diana is attending General Convention in Maryland. And as noted in the Sunday paper, we can log in to the media hub at the web address given and watch live stream coverage of events, as well as check out the media briefings from the Office of Public Affairs. I have viewed a few videos and live stream coverage of one of the sessions from the House of Deputies. It's quite interesting. For those of us who have never had the good fortune, to attend an Episcopal Church convention, I urge you to take the opportunity to check out the action virtually. The book club will be meeting tomorrow, I believe, to discuss Sam Wright's book that is called Smart Alex Guide to the Bible. I'm sure it's going to be an interesting debate. All other announcements are noted in Sunday's paper. Thank you. There is one additional announcement that I've been asked to make, um, and it involves uh, Darren and Ken. Are they here? They're not here? Because they are celebrating their wedding anniversary, and I was asked to give them a blessing. Uh, Darren and Ken. Oh, they, oh, they, that's right. They may be virtual. Darren and Ken, we assume that you are there, and so <laughs> let us pray. Oh God, you have so consecrated the covenant of marriage that in it is represented the spiritual unity between Christ and his church. Send therefore your blessing upon Darren and Ken, your servants, so that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other in faithfulness and patience, in wisdom and true godliness, that their home may be a haven of blessing and peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And there in heaven may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, upon you to remain with you all days. Amen. 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 Now, dear friends, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice.
thanks and praise. But before we go on, let us shed some light on the altar. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Christ and with Christ and in Christ, 
in the unity of the Holy Spirit. To you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever.
God of abundance, you have set us in the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one for all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. May the wisdom of God and the love of God and the grace of God strengthen you to be Christ's hands and heart in the world. And the blessing of God, our Creator, Christ, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.